welcome. My name's David Malone, and I'm fortunate to work at the UN University in Tokyo. Uh, today, uh, we are launching a book on uh, relations across a wide range of fields between uh, India and Japan. Uh, and we'll have uh, later today two of the authors in the book speaking. We also have the two editors who pulled the book together and uh, with whom we'll be having a brief video conversation a bit later. Uh, but first, we have with us Raja Mohan, uh, noted uh, geostrategic authority from India, who has worked abroad a great deal but always returns to his own country in the long run. Uh, he is currently leading uh, the Carnegie Endowment Office in uh, Delhi. Uh, he's a prolific author, and I should say that he wrote the book uh, a number of years ago that really broke the mold on Indian foreign policy. It was called Crossing the Rubicon. And uh, I think it's actually relevant to our topic today, India-Japan relations. So could I ask you, uh, Raja, to sum up or, or sort of um, encapsulate the book briefly and its thesis? Yeah, I mean, essentially the book was looking at uh, the fact that in the post-reform era, that India began its economic reforms uh, in 1991, uh, and as its nature of its economy and its uh, international economic orientation changed uh, from an inward uh, socialist self-reliant uh, framework to one of globalization and liberalization, uh, that its foreign policy had also begun to change. Uh, it's, uh, in retrospect, uh, it was quite self-evident that, <laughs> that that would happen. Uh, but uh, because uh, the you know we were all part of the process, I mean, I think suddenly, you could see that. I mean, I think mm. I used to follow the, the foreign policy developments quite closely. Mm. So this book was written in 2002, 2003. Mm. So you could see that decade uh, of change in the foreign policy in the reform era, mm. uh, that you saw the way India reconnected uh, with the West, mm. uh, it renewed the engagement with China and Japan mm. and Europe, the other powers, uh, and it began to focus more on trade, uh, investment, uh, relationships, rather than the past emphasis on uh, non-aligned movement, uh, third worldism, mm -hmm. and those kind of uh, issues. And then uh, it also returned to a more uh, regional focus, uh, that while we dismiss the neighborhood as impossible to one of actually arguing, we need to engage, we need to uh, you know, improve our relations with the neighborhood, and then also reconnect to the extended neighborhood. That India, in fact, under Nehru, uh, began with the focus on Asia, and then you see after 91 the, the Look East policy, the Indian Ocean emphasis, that we come back to the natural moorings of India's geography, while at the same time reconnecting on a different economic orientation. And I think 25 years after that growth, uh, we see the full consequences of that, the nature of uh, India's strategic partnership with the US and Japan stand out the most uh, significant uh, changes now as you look back mm. uh, 25 years after reform. Coming uh, now to the book itself, uh, the basic idea was to get uh, well-established uh, Indian and Japanese authors writing on a given topic with a younger uh, author, and this in practice seems to have worked very well. Your topic, in some ways, is the most newsworthy. Uh, it has to do with the strategic relationship between the two countries and the reasons for an enhanced strategic relationship. How, how did you develop the argument? Yeah, I mean, before I talk about the, the strategic relationship, I, I, I just wanted to mention the other book uh, that you and I edited. Oh, yes. On, on uh, Oxford Handbook on India's Foreign Policy. Mm. It's amazing that we omitted uh, to include Japan as a chapter. Mm. Uh, the sense that, look, it is the India-Japan relationship mm. is still to mature. Mm. I mean, that's what was on our minds when yes. we said, look, I mean, we're not going to have a separate yes. chapter on Japan. So in some sense, there was, uh, 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 I would say, under-representation or mm. under-estimation mm. of where this relationship mm. would go. Because I think what began with high hopes in the 50s ended up actually a fairly, you know, estranged, I would yes. say, in the 90s and 2000s. And I think what we saw happen uh, 
uh, even in front of our eyes in the last few years, is the uh, commitment today to build this relationship into something more solid and more substantive. And we've seen that uh, since uh, Koizumi, Prime Minister Koizumi's visit to India, uh, there's been a fairly uh, accelerated growth of this relationship. And I think in the book that captures that, that sense, uh, the, the hopes of the 50s uh, when Nehru took a very different approach to Japan than everybody else uh, in the world and in Asia. Yes. Uh, Nehru was quite clear that Japan should not be isolated, mm. that any structuring of a post-war Asia must necessarily involve a large and substantive role from Japan. So that was quite a, quite a unique view and I think that got him a lot of uh, resonance and empathy in, in Japan, but we did not really fully build on it and by the 60s uh, we were drifting apart, India was looking inwards, uh, Japan was getting, uh, you know, it was growing very fast mm. and then we couldn't take full advantage of it. And then you had uh, Japan and US becoming full-fledged allies and India drifting towards the Soviet Union. Mm. So in many ways that uh, what was seen so possible in the 50s uh, just, you know, was, was just disappeared into thin air. And it's only after the 1990s as India opens up its economy that Japan once again becomes important. And, and, but then the, the nuclear issue, mm. the difference, the deep differences on the nuclear issue. Uh, nobody got so much uh, uh, angry than, uh, angrier than Japan, mm. uh, the way it reacted to India's nuclear tests. Uh, cut off uh, quite a bit of the relationship. Uh, we ended for a short while the the aid, uh, and and I think that was a, a low point in the bilateral relationship. So the chapter covers that part. Yes. And then how we overcame that mm. in the following years. Mm. I mean, I think uh, in the 2000s, how did we overcome that? I think we we have a lot to thank America for mm. because once American attitude changed, uh, many American allies in Asia also began to take a fresh look at India and Japan too does it. But then it was not as if Japan was a purely dependent variable on the US. We had to engage the Japanese mm. quite hard to convince them that look, uh, we need to rethink the nuclear thing. Mm. That you can't just, you know, mm. uh, uh, that, we, we, that, that we need to find a way out. Mm. So I think it has taken us a while, but eventually uh, after the book came out, now finally uh, India and the US, India and Japan, have announced uh, that the negotiations are complete. Now mm. it's really the legislative processes uh, that will uh, allow Japan to begin a civil nuclear cooperation with India. And then it also touches on the expansion of the defense cooperation a little bit. And the trilateral cooperation between India, US, Japan. Mm. I mean, it would have been unthinkable in the non-aligned age that India would do joint exercises with the Americans and the Japanese. Which is what we started in 2007, but then the previous government, as the UPA government, pulled back. Mm. Now we have the Narendra Modi government actually restoring mm. more intensive uh, engagement, uh, uh, military engagement mm. with the Japanese, and and I think that's that's the other uh, part. Mm. We also look in the chapter at uh, some of the other issues like on space, on cyber, uh, the potential uh, possibilities mm. uh, for greater engagement uh, between mm. India and Japan. And finally, the chapter looks at that how do India and Japan structure a, an Asian balance of power system? This is not about containing China, this is not about opposing China on everything, but this is about creating that stability. And my sense is uh, uh, that uh, India and Japan will need to take larger responsibilities uh, as the, uh, we'll come back to that point later maybe, but, but on how the U.S. is evolving mm. and how the U.S. approach to the region is changing. Absolutely. Now, there are two other issues I wanted to ask you about before we sign off. Uh, the first is energy. The two countries share uh, a challenge on energy, Japan particularly since the Fukushima uh, disaster uh, caused the government to shut down much, uh, most of the nuclear plants in Japan while they're being checked. Uh, so Japan became all of a sudden again worried about mm -hmm. energy supply and India has been worried about energy mm -hmm. supply for quite a while, especially with over-reliance on coal, which is cheap but dirty, increasingly threatening the environment in India. Um, so do you find that um, in your conversations with Japanese interlocutors, the energy uh, chapter is a lively one in the relationship? Absolutely. But my, my sense is, uh, again, I think uh, just when we were getting close to a nuclear agreement mm. where actually Japan began to look at exporting nuclear power plants, 
Japan's own, you know, the, the accident uh, created a terrible situation for uh, nuclear power's future in this country. And uh, India's uh, beginning to invest some in that, that we need to, that we have a chance to put nuclear back to uh, its reasonable place uh, in the energy mix. So that's one part. The second, I think, in terms of energy conservation uh, and the new energy technologies, Japan has done a, a lot of things. And that's where I think India has a lot to learn from the Japanese. And I think how Japanese can contribute to uh, how India can produce energy by saving it. Mm. I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that has to be an important uh, part of it. Mm. And also the, it being a sustainable uh, energy strategy and not one that merely depends on fossil fuels. Mm. And at, at another level, uh, that since both of us are going to be reliant on the uh, oil, that essentially that which comes from the Persian Gulf, uh, it has produced two interesting sets of outcomes, I think. One, uh, both of us have had a, well, both in India and Iran, sorry, India and Japan have had a uh, special relationship with Iran. And we see some of that coming back. I mean, I, my sense is, uh, I believe Japan is very interested in working with India in, uh, in doing some projects in Iran, yes. including the so-called Chabahar mm. port. That's one part. Second part is that energy security and maritime security are linked. Yes. And there, I think both India and Japan, I think, have moved some distance in securing the sea lanes of communication. Mm -hmm. That Japan has played some role in the in, after the piracy issue in the in the Gulf of Aden, much like China. I mean, Japan mm -hmm. today has a has a regular presence there. And Japan has also acquired a, a base in the uh, in the in Djibouti. Yes. So I think it it puts I think it brings also India and Japan that look we now have to work together in the Indian Ocean, mm. uh, in the larger framing of the Indian Ocean. And that's where I think Prime Minister Abe's uh, speech in 2007, when he came to India, mm. and his talk about the confluence of the two seas, uh, that I think that produces the whole notion of an Indo-Pacific, mm. uh, that the maritime issues, uh, energy security mm. issues, uh, ocean governance issues today bring India and Japan much closer. Uh, it's though it is not only about energy, mm. but it's, it has something to do with energy as mm. well. And one senses that uh, Prime Minister Abe for a long time now has been more deeply interested in India than most politicians and primarily from a sense that India can complement Japan and partner with it on key objectives. Now the last point I wanted to raise uh, relates to a deficit in the relationship and that is in spite of a great deal of political level encouragement actually business figures between the two countries both investment and trade are pretty pathetic for the number two and number three economic powers in Asia uh, and this does not seem to be budging particularly so what uh, how do you approach this quandary because I think I, you're, you're absolutely right. Mm. I think there is a big deficit on the business side, uh, given the potential of this mm. uh, relationship and the, and the fact that uh, Japan's companies have actually been engaged in India mm. for so long. I mean, in fact, some of them date back to 100 years. Yes. Yet, uh, the India's, even in the reform period, uh, that Japanese businessmen had found it hard to uh, engage India, mm. the rules of uh, uh, you know, business mm. are very hard, uh, mm. as you very well know. <laughs> India is not an easy place to do business. And mm. I think while the Koreans and others have moved in more uh, decisively and successfully, the Japanese have remained uh, hesitant. So in some way, uh, what Modi and Abe are trying to do is to create that a, a, a potentially a framework where uh, you bring in greater Japanese uh, assistance and see if there are assistance in the development of infrastructure and modernization of India's uh, manufacturing sector can bring in uh, the Japanese companies. So, but it is still work in progress. I mean, I think mm. uh, that's a big deficit. Mm. Uh, and both in terms of trade as well. I mean, I think its, it's figures are not very high and I think that's a huge problem. And linked to this is the insufficient contact at the civil society. Yes, absolutely. And the yeah. uh, interest in Japanese language or Japanese culture. Well, there is a lot of goodwill for Japan. I mean, no other Asian country has as much goodwill for Japan. Mm. But yet, uh, we don't have those bonds, mm. uh, you know, reinforced mm. uh, at the popular level, the number of people traveling up and down. All that has remained uh, uh, really uh, fairly, uh, uh, shall we say, I mean, way below the potential. I think uh, rejuvenating those ties mm. or boosting them 
uh, is an important uh, part of the agenda. But uh, as I said, that, that we, we'll have to see how much of it will actually well, be done. Well, the, uh, the book fortunately gets into all of this head yeah. on. And uh, tonight for our conversation, we'll be joined by one of your Japanese co-authors, Nobuo Tanaka, mm -hmm who today, today is uh, president of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. I don't think there is an organization in Japan that works harder no. on the relationship between the two countries uh, than uh, the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. And he is also an international energy yeah, expert, exactly. uh, yeah. the former head of the International Energy Agency, in fact. So this evening, we'll probably get yeah. more into the energy issues. Meanwhile, uh, Raj, many thanks Thank for you. joining us. For those of you joining us online, uh, as you can see, we're likely to have a very interesting conversation tonight. This is a, in some ways underdeveloped bilateral relationship, which is one of the most important in the world today. And the mystery is why the economic dimension of it is as underdeveloped while the geostrategic dimension actually is moving ahead very decisively and what can be done about that. Thank you very much for joining us online.